Welcome to worship in the Unitarian Universalist Church of Charlotte. Such stalwarts. <laughs> so there was a meeting in between the service between the board and our worship team, and they have in fact granted that attendance today counts twice. <laughs> So if you're looking to enhance your record of attendance, you can, you can count this as having been here two Sundays for having made it in. <laughs> so having said that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that um, is um, un-Unitarian, and that is I'm going to invite all of us into the center section. Thank you. Today's uh, service commends our being close together, having close proximity to one another. Brene Brown, as many of you know, is a professor of social work and a much celebrated author and speaker. In a conversation with Krista Tippett, Brene Brown offers a simple, simply profound affirmation. The most beautiful things I look back on in my life, she said, are coming out from underneath things I didn't know I could get out from underneath. The moments I look back in my life and think, God, those are the moments that made me were moments of struggle. Welcome today to those who are right now going through something that you don't know if you can get out from underneath. Welcome to those engaged right now in moments of struggle of some kind. Welcome to those here today made by, made beautiful by the moments, the experiences, the times of pain. Today we gather Recreate the sanctuary of safety and compassion, a circle into which we are now all invited to step. Welcome.
When we are grieving or sad, when we are challenged, when we need help, this flame guides us out of the darkness. When we are cheerful, when we celebrate, when we accomplish a great task, when we return to a place that makes us happy, the chalice reminds us to share our happiness with others. This morning's first reading is from Mary Oliver's Heavy from Thirst. That time I thought I could not go any closer to grief without dying. I went closer and did not die. Surely God had his hand in this, as well as friends. Still I was bent, and my laughter, as the poet said, was nowhere to be found. Then said my friend Daniel, brave even among lions, it's not the weight you carry, but how you carry it. Books, bricks, grief, it's all in the way you embrace it, balance it, carry it, when you cannot and would not put it down. So I went practicing. Have you noticed? Have you heard the laughter that comes now and again out of my startled mouth? How I linger to admire, admire, admire the things of this world that are kind and maybe also troubled. Roses in the wind, the sea geese on the steep waves, a love to which there is no reply. Our second reading is by the poet Al Albert Huffstickler, his poem, The Cure. We think we get over things. We don't get over things. 
or say, we get over the measles, but not a broken heart. We need to make that distinction. The things that become a part of our experience never become less a part of our experience. How can I say it? The way to get over a life is to die. Short of that, you move with it. Let the pain be pain. Not in the hopes that it will vanish, but in the faith that it will fit in. Find its place in the shape of things. And be then not any less pain, but true to form. Because anything natural has an inherent shape and will flow into it. And a life is as natural as a leaf. That's what we're looking for. Not, not the end of a thing, but the shape of it. Wisdom. Wisdom is seeing the shape of your life without obliterating, getting over a single instant of it. I invite us to remain seated for our next song.
on the south side of Highway 641 in rural Allendale County, South Carolina, there's a cemetery surrounded by a simple chain link fence. Since the last decades of the 19th century, grieving neighbors in the Bethel community have come there to say farewell to family and friends laid to rest in that sandy soil. The wind whispers in soft susurrations through tall pines on either side. Morning doves call out their sorrowful song in the early dawn, damp with dewfall and scented with honeysuckle entwined along the roadside. Away from the highway over on the far side, there's a small plot with a modest marble enclosure containing a pair of unmatched miniature gravestones. One is marked Howard E. Fox, the other simply infant son. Both are identified as son of C.S. and Alma Fox. Howard, one gravestone announces, died December 13th, 1932, not yet a month and a half old. The infant son died almost exactly six years later on December 8th, 1938, a single date on his stone suggesting a likely stillbirth. In between those two tragic Decembers, the grief-stricken couple's unspeakable pall was lifted by the springtime birth of a little girl. I know this because C.S. and Alma Fox were my maternal grandparents. Their little girl, that daughter born between the deaths of those two sons, is my mom. It was in the April of my seventh year, the occasion of my great-grandmother's death, when my family assembled in that cemetery under a tent just to the side of that simple plot. My dad escorted my sister and me over to those little gravestones. He softly explained that my mom's two little brothers were buried there. The memory is still vivid, I suppose, because of the shock of that revelation. We knew my mom as my grandparents' only child. We knew my grandparents as loving and fun-loving, seemingly satisfied and content, living lives so very closely interwoven into our own lives. How could there be another story? other children, a whole other side to my grandparents' lives about which we knew nothing at all. I never heard those losses discussed again until late in my grandfather's long life. By then, I suspected that our intensely close relationship was due in part to my being the recipient, not just of the love that he had for his eldest grandson, but also the unrealized love for two little sons he never got to enjoy. One day, as was often his habit, he reflected introspectively, I've had a good life. But this time was different. At last he confessed, looking back, there were some difficult times. When I lost those little boys, it was so hard. After a pause, he affirmed, now though I realize the good has far outweighed the bad. He seemed so intent on assuring me that his had been a good life. 
I was at that point in the conversation several years into my career as a minister. I'd been with individuals and families upended and undone by all sorts of suffering, all kinds of calamities, all manner of pain and hardship and heartache and heartbreak. By then, I knew my grandparents' situation, though astoundingly difficult, was hardly unprecedented. In fact, I was coming to realize that most people are carrying some pain, some difficult memory, some sadness, some shame, some burden, some hardship, some deep stress. Poet Gwendolyn Brooks admits, everybody here is infirm. Everybody here is infirm. As a minister, I've learned something else too, an awareness that I've had reconfirmed over and over. My grandfather, whose life included one of the worst tragedies humans can suffer, the death of a young child twice, actually described his life as good. It was, he said, blessed. He wasn't alone in that either. Yes, we humans endure so much. Yes, everyone has some public or private pain, some burden we have had to carry, are still carrying, will face. But, but we are also survivors. We endure, we carry on. The human psyche is astoundingly, remarkably resilient. As Mary Oliver puts it, that time I thought I could not go any closer to grief without dying. I went closer. And I didn't die. Some of us hearing this morning's opening music will recall the iconic video that accompanied REM's song, Everybody Hurts. The band is shown riding together in a car that is soon stranded in a snarling traffic jam. As the somber lyrics play, when the day is long and the night, the night is yours alone, when you're sure you've had enough of this life. The camera zooms in on the occupants of surrounding cars. Subtitles flash on the screen, revealing their inmost thoughts. A mom whose unruly child is tumbling over the seat ponders, I had no idea. A forlorn looking young guy thinks, they are going to miss me. Through the back of a station wagon, we see a couple arguing and read, here we go again. What is she thinking? A pickup truck driver in a ball cap, 17 years. A mustachioed, blank-faced man, how am I going to do this? Three people dressed up, tears in their eyes. She's gone. A world-weary woman, there's nothing I can do. And the band sings. Well, everybody hurts sometimes. Everybody cries. And everybody hurts sometimes. And everybody hurts sometimes. Their message, likely no surprise to anyone here today, may nonetheless serve as a helpful reminder. Everybody hurts. Everybody cries. If you are here today and you are hurting, if you are one of the many people who admit to me often sheepishly that you're not quite sure why you cry in services here, you're not alone. Sometimes we may feel like everybody else has it all together or 
everyone else's life is so much better or easier or less painful? Probably not. To be human is to hurt. To be human is to carry at times some weight of pain, of grief, of anxiety, of anger, of utter frustration. To be human, as Albert Huffstickler wrote, is to have some things that we don't get over. It's what we have in common, perhaps most in common. Imagine if, as in the video, you could read the thoughts of others. Imagine you could see the real deep down ponderings of those you love, of those sitting near you right now, of the teacher down the hall, of the couple in the apartment next door, of the guy in the next cubicle, of the neighbors across the street, of those stuck beside you in traffic here. Imagine how am I going to make ends meet? Why couldn't it have worked out if I could only find a job? I feel so lonely. I'm so worried about my child. I'm not sure how much more I can take. I'm so ashamed of myself. How can he do this to me? I just can't seem to stop drinking or using. I wonder what the doctor's going to say. Why even bother? Nobody cares. In a room with five people, six griefs, Tallies Jane Hirschfield then reminds us, some you will hear of, some not. That daughter of C.S. and Alma Fox, my mom, now walks through her days in a dementia-induced fog, increasingly distancing her from us. Oh, her eyes still light up on visits. She knows we have some connection. But then, without warning, she'll begin to wander, offering observations, questions we cannot follow, experiencing frustration at our confusion. Beside her, my dad, her beloved husband of 62 years, smiles. He sometimes rolls his eyes. He nods knowingly. This is what my days are like now. I carry that weighty awareness into every single day. Cognizant that while I am pouring myself into an expansive life here, just as they would wish, their life contracts a little more every day. A loss, not momentous, but rather moment by moment by quiet moment. Meanwhile, another tender part of my heart is loose in the world. Our kid now claiming a new identity, a new understanding and expression. So bold, so clear, and so vulnerable. How will they it is, we're told, the preferred pronoun now. How will they fare in a world in which so many can be so vicious? And what does it mean for me as a long-standing public advocate 
to now be filled with pride and rage and fear and hope that is so deeply, deeply personal. Most of us know, though we often forget, what we hear, see, experience, assume about one another is so often not the real story or certainly not the whole story. Who would have guessed that C.S. and Alma Fox, seemingly so comfortable, happy, successful, had two very empty places in their hearts that would never be filled, that they'd never get over. Most of us know, though we often forget, that bluster, insensitivity, selfishness, anger, hatred even, are so often the masks we humans wear in hopes of disguising our insecurities, our fears, our pain, our self-doubts, our envy, our shame. Everybody hurts. Everybody cries. We all try to cope in some ways that are healthier and more mature than others. But for all of that, we are so remarkably resilient. Resilience, the word comes from a Latin word meaning to spring back. Resilience reflects a certain elasticity, a flexibility, the capacity to endure being pushed or pulled one way, then somehow returning back to another. It is, it really is one of life's greatest miracles. We are resilient. We spring back. Look at you. Look at us. We have such astounding inner resources. Think of all that we have endured Think of all that you are going through, that we are going through. And yet, we're here. We're up, moving around, carrying on, being cogent and considerate and creative. Have you heard, poet Mary Oliver ask, have you heard the laughter that comes now and again out of my startled mouth? Yes. Please comfort me. Let's sing and laugh and dance with me as well. Gwendolyn Brooks didn't stop with her declaration that everybody here is infirm. She continues, Today I say to them, say to them, say to them, Lord, look, I am beautiful. Beautiful with my wing that is wounded, my eye that is bonded, or my ear not funded, or my walk all a wobble. I'm enough to be beautiful. You are, she adds, you are beautiful too. She's right. You're beautiful. Not because you're perfect, unsullied, unscarred. Beautiful even because you are flawed and fallen, wounded, hurt, scarred. I know many of your stories now. I know what you've been through. I've heard your sorrow. I've witnessed your suffering. And I marvel. I marvel because there is something in you that has sustained you and carried you and kept you together even during those times when you were falling apart. What may be all the more remarkable about human beings is this. We not only carry on, we care. 
with enough concerns of our own to occupy us, we nonetheless reach out to another, offer a hand up, a pat on the back, a shoulder to cry on, a kind word, a hug, a meal, a card, a call. With our own needs yet unmet, we stretch ourselves, we offer our energy, our time, our resources in the name of justice and equity, out of concern for our fragile planet and its most marginalized people. We do the work of healing, which is the work of making whole, of mending what has been torn, of tending what has been wounded. Early in my education toward ministry, I was guided to the work of the Dutch Catholic priest Henri Nouwen. Nouwen, we now know, was troubled by depression, by a longing for intimacy in conflict with his priestly vows, by an awareness of himself as a gay man, an identity he found very difficult to own as the truth about himself. His biographer, Michael Ford, suggests these intense struggles took an enormous emotional, spiritual, physical toll on his life. Perhaps that's why he could write in that first book of his I read, a guide to what it means to be a minister called the Wounded Healer. In it, now in rights, when we experience the healing presence of another person, we can discover our own gifts for healing. Then our wounds, our wounds, allow us to enter into a deep solidarity with our wounded siblings. Maybe when we are at our best, that's what we are here a collection of wounded healers. We are those who know life is indeed difficult. We are those who also exhibit an astounding resilience, the capacity not just to survive, but to thrive. And even in our woundedness, we are those who care enough to reach out to others who are wounded with words and deeds of healing, compassion, and transformative intentions. After all, everybody here is infirm. Everybody here is infirm. And... And you are beautiful, too. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mary Ann Hendrick. I joined this church in 2012 following the death of my mother. My mother died December 6, 2011, St. Nicholas Day, the German holiday we always celebrated with her giving me a new pair of slippers. She was there, and then she was gone. It wasn't that sudden, really. We knew she had terminal cancer, had known for two years. But she had survived the Nazi labor camps. She'd survived fleeing across Europe on a bicycle to get to American lines. She'd survived immigration to a new land. She'd survived divorce. She'd survived single motherhood in the 50s with no daycare. She'd survived my teen years when I so originally advised that I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> she was a survivor. She would beat this, but she didn't. I was left shaken, bereft, abandoned, without the one person who'd known me from my very first day, the woman who had taught me the importance of faith without ever going to church, the woman who taught me no matter how little you had, you had something to spare. The woman who taught me to laugh at myself instead of taking offense. The woman who taught me never to settle when making a decision. And the woman who taught me to love books and promised that one day I would read by author and not jacket cover. <laughs> she was there and then she was gone. So I cried. There was no consolation. No one could ever have suffered a loss as great as mine. John Green wrote in The Fault in Our Stars, the pleasure of remembering had been taken from me because there was no longer anyone to remember with. It felt like losing your co-rememberer meant losing the memory itself. As if things we'd done were less real and important than they had been just hours before. He got it. I cried. Each day there was something I wanted to ask her, tell her, show her. I cried. This January, I asked Rocky if we could take a trip to Florida, mom's winter home, and see some people that had been such a big part of her life and I had not seen for many, many years. He readily agreed and we took what he has since dubbed the 2018 Old People Tour. <laughs> As part of me knew that I needed something to help me